This morning, we're going to take a look at the book of Jonah. And uh, we're actually, we're going to make it through the entire book of Jonah. I promise I won't keep you past four o'clock. Um, but uh, if, if you have a roast, it may burn. Um, we'll be fine. We'll, we'll make it out of here at least by 2.30. So, book of Jonah. This morning, we'll go through the book of Jonah. Uh, we're going to not necessarily do an in-depth study of the book of Jonah. We're not going to necessarily either do a study over the most common theme on the book of Jonah, which would obviously be Jonah and the great whale. We're all very familiar, or the great fish, uh, however you want to render that. Uh, we're all very familiar with that story and what happens. Uh, but I'm afraid that we're not familiar with uh, the entire um, concept, the entire premise of the book of Jonah, because it's much deeper and much more meaningful than Jonah getting swallowed by a great fish and getting spat out on land by a great fish. So this morning I'd like to take a, a briefing over the book of Jonah. And what we'll see is four different things here in the book of Jonah. Jonah chapter 1, we'll see rebellion. In chapter 2, we'll see repentance. Chapter 3, we'll see revival. In chapter 4, we'll see regret. Jonah comes to find some things out in this rendering that we have of, of this short period of his life. Jonah finds out that when you're in the will of God, things are much easier for you. And today we're looking at this, and we'll notice when we dive into this book, there's some social divide that's put a massive tension on the entire premise of the book of Jonah, and, that, and that's and that's why this that's why this book is here because there's this great social divide that's going on that has that has caused the command of God to be delivered to Jonah, and so there's this tension. And today we also see a tension. We see in my lifetime this is obviously the uh, the worst that the social divide has been. Uh, political parties have been splits down the middle, and uh, we have people that are very nasty towards others with this. We have people who are very hateful towards others, uh, and, and it's not just politics. It's, it seems like every realm uh, of life that you walk in right now that there is just a massive divide, not only in America, but, but in the world. There's a lot of tension going on right now, and the book of Jonah uh, sheds a little bit of light on the social divide, on the tension that we see. And so I'd just like to open now with Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. It says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. Let's pray this morning as we come before the Lord. Father, thank you for your words that you've given to us and for your grace and for your love towards us. Father, thank you for this time to open your word. Pray, God, that you would just bless, Lord, the speaking of your word and, and those who are hearing it, Lord, that you would, Lord, just speak to hearts and minds and speak through me this morning, Father, that you would be glorified in, in our lives, Lord, and that your name would be exalted everywhere. We do love you and praise you in Christ's name. Amen. And so as we open the book of Jonah, we see the very first thing that happens is we see God give an imperative to Jonah. Jonah is given a command by God just as we were given a command by Christ. In the book of Matthew, we were given the command to go and Jonah was given the command to go. And we see that here as it says that the Lord speaks to Jonah, the prophet, and says to go to Nineveh, the great, the large city, and to cry against it, he says, because their wickedness is come up from before me. Jonah's told to do two things. It's an imperative. Number one, go to Nineveh. It's a direct, it's a simple command. And secondly, God says, when you get to Nineveh, cry against it. Preach literally means to cry out. He is the town crier. The preaching is a proclamation. And God has said here that their sin, their wickedness is come up from before me. And to me, this is a very interesting phrase here. Here's, here's our God, who is both omniscient and omnipresent, meaning he knows all things and he is everywhere 
all the time. And he is everywhere present. He says, their wickedness has come up before me. This is, this is some strong language being used here because you, you have to take into account that there is nothing that's ever hidden from God. But he's taking a special mention here to say that this group of people, these Ninevites, these people from Nineveh, uh, their sin is, is at an exceptional level that it is, it, that is in front of his face. Their wickedness has come before him. Go to Nineveh where you're called. Cry against them. Proclaim to Nineveh that if there's no repentance, that there will be judgment. And why will there be judgment? Because God said that the wickedness is ever before him. Jonah 1 and verse 3. We looked this morning. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So Jonah was given a command by God, but the very next verse that we read, Jonah does not actually follow that command. Jonah takes different action. Nineveh happened to be up uh, northeast of where Jonah was, but Jonah rose up that morning, went to Joppa, and decided that he would not go northeast. Geographically speaking, Jonah was on a ship heading due west. Why did Jonah retreat? Why did Jonah run? Because Jonah, the text tells us, was trying to flee from the presence of the Lord. Jonah ran because Jonah did not want what God wanted. Plain and simple, that Jonah had his own agenda, his own plan, that he wanted to do what Jonah wanted to do, not what God wanted him to do. So he gets up in the morning, he goes down to Joppa, he does take immediate action. He does, he does actually move, but he moves the wrong direction. He takes immediate action, goes down to the, to the shipyard there at Joppa, to the port, and he gets on a boat heading to Tarshish. This goes to show you that just because an opportunity presents itself, you don't have to jump on it. Jonah happens to go down to the port city, and right, he's got this command to go up into Nineveh, northeast, and so he goes to Joppa, and he's at the port, and, and uh, all of a sudden there's this boat there, and Jonah decides that he's not only going to get on this boat, but he's going to pay these guys to take him way away, like, like 2,000 plus miles away from Nineveh. This is like 2,500 miles where, where, where Jonah is attempting to go to Tarshish. It's like the, the southern tip of Spain today. The very, they're very far western portion of the Mediterranean, which to Jonah would have been more than likely the, the, the furthest place that he could conceive of away from Nineveh. Just because an opportunity presents itself does not mean that it's God's will for you to do so. And the problem that we have is oftentimes we... We fantasize God's will into our lives. We want to think, well, just because certain circumstances fold together, that it must that it must be, you know, this is what God wants me to do. Well, this has presented itself to me, you know, obviously God wants me to buy this vehicle because it's, you know, it's on sale, or God wants me to marry this woman, you know, because because she's a godly woman. No, God wants you to do what God says He wants you to do. That's God's will, and we shouldn't mystify it into being uh, something that we perceive it to be. Uh, God's will is more simple than what we make it out to be. God wants you to do what His Word says. And so just because something presents itself does not mean that's necessarily God's will. So conveniently, Jonah finds this ship, right? And he heads, gets on it, pays these people, and he gets ready to head for Tarshish. Why did Jonah decide, though, that he wanted to go to Tarshish. Was Jonah afraid to preach to the Ninevites? I would argue no. I don't think Jonah was afraid of Nineveh. I don't think at all that that was what was going through Jonah's mind. Chapter 4 will show us what Jonah knew in advance. But I will tell you this. The reason that Jonah was leaving, the reason that Jonah was fleeing, is because Jonah had an accurate understanding of who God was. 
you say, well, that seems kind of contradictory because Jonah is not listening to God. Well, it's not. And when we get to chapter 4, you'll see. But Jonah flees because he knew exactly who God was. And he knew exactly what God was going to do. And he didn't want that. Look what happens. God sends out a great wind into the sea with such fierce winds that that boat just liked to have broken half. Verse 5 says, Then the mariners were very afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship and he lay and was fast asleep. If, if, if the sea is so violent that the sailors are afraid, then you know that, that the common man would obviously be feeling some fright here. Where do you find Jonah in the midst of all this? When God sends these massive waves and wind into the sea, the sailors are terrified. And where is Jonah? He's down in the belly of the boat, asleep. What's the scenario we have going on? We have one rebellious Christian who is in the belly of the boat, sleeping, content, mind you. And you have all these pagan sailors who are grasping at anything that they can to throw overboard so that their ship doesn't sink. They're doing whatever they can think of. They're crying to their gods. They are throwing everything overboard, and, and it is not working. The ship is ready to take on water. It is ready to sink. The last thing they think of is, let's go find Jonah. Jonah sleeps right through the whole thing. Cargo going overboard. The creaking of the timbers in the ship. The yelling of the men. Jonah sleeping right through God's first wake-up call he gives him. And can I suggest to you this morning that when we are content living outside the will of God, that it becomes very easy to sleep through God's wake-up call. The longer that you hit God's snooze button, so to speak, the longer that you deny God's will for your life, the longer that you deny what God desires for you to do, the easier it gets to sleep through God's wake-up call. Jonah's content here. He's sleeping, and I want to urge you this morning that there can come a time where if you ignore God's call too many times, you can stay asleep. And it's a sad day, folks, when, when a Christian is rebuked by a lost person. Let's look here at verse 6. It says, So the shipmaster, the captain, he comes to him and he says to Jonah, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. Right? They've tried everything else at this point. So they go down, they find Jonah, he's sleeping, he's content. And this guy wakes him up, the captain of the ship, he's like, what are you doing? Who do you think you are? Why are you not crying to your God? Pray to your God. Our gods are not answering. Maybe your God will hear your prayer and save us from this storm. So then what do the men do? They, they cast lots to find out whose fault it is that the storm has come upon them. And what do they conclude? The lot fell upon Jonah. So they quickly inquire of Jonah. What's your occupation? What do you do? Where are you from? What's your country? What people are you from? And verse 9, Jonah's response, an unfortunate one, he says, And he said unto them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Well, you wouldn't think so by the way that he's acting at this point. You wouldn't think that he has this reverence for God. You wouldn't think that he has this fear. Look at the response that the men give. Verse 10. Then were the men exceedingly afraid and said unto him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he told them, right? So Jonah came clean to them. He told them, you know, God wanted me to go to Nineveh. I'm not going to Nineveh because I know what God's going to do. So I'm going to Tarshish. And they say, why have you done this? You said you're a man that fears God. 
said, I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which made the sea and the dry land. You see the testimony that Jonah's leaving behind? You see how easy it is for a Christian to put on a bad testimony and, and, and how these folks are always watching your life? You know, nobody's blaming anybody else but Jonah at this point. You know, they're not saying to each other, well, you know, why, why are you not worshiping the one and only God? You know, they're looking at the guy who should be Jonah, and, and, and now all fingers are pointed to Jonah, and, and it is truly and indeed his fault here, the situation they're in. So Jonah admits to it. Jonah takes some obedience, and, and he admits that this is his fault. What's their solution? Verse 11, he's, they said, uh, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm unto us, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous? Verse 12, And he said to them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you, for I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. All right, this is jo Jonah's fessing up, and, and, and he says, Okay, I know how to fix the problem. I am the one that sinned against God. I know what God wanted me to do. So to fix this problem and to get you out of danger, throw me into the sea. Well, what's their response? Mind you, pagans. Okay? Verse 13, Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to land. They didn't want to kill Jonah. Pagan men, praying to their gods, Jonah, pitifully asleep up until the last... 15 minutes of this escapade and these men are going to attempt to row this boat to shore to try to save Jonah who brought the danger upon their life can I contextualize this today with the folks who want to say I'm a good person I don't deserve hell I would do anything, you know, and, and you hear this all the time. Well, I'm a good person, so I'm going to go to heaven. If I'm good enough, I'll go to heaven. If I do good enough things, I'll go to heaven, right? These guys are obviously pretty solid guys, right? Because if, if you did this to me and you were the reason that this boat was, I would be really okay with throwing you over the ship. You know, I, I, I honestly, you know, if, if we're being honest this morning, I would, I would kick you off, you know, with ease. Um, these guys, you know, hats off to them. They try, when, when you've got these waves crashing over the side of the boat, they try to take their paddles and they try to get the boat to shore. They're genuinely good people. But they're lacking genuine salvation from God. It's not about if you're a good person. None of us are good people. We really aren't. We're rotten. And, you know, ask, ask my wife. She puts up with me all the time. Uh, you know, and, and, and Christians... We, we, are, we are rotten people. We are all sinners. We have all got attitudes. We have all got things that, that we have that we struggle with. We all struggle with a sin or multiple sins. And, and it's not about being a good person. You can't be a good person. It is not in your nature. And God knew that. That's why He made a provision for you. These guys cast these lots. They try to get Jonah to shore. It doesn't work. So ultimately, what do they do? It's really a beautiful thing. Verse 14. Wherefore, they cried unto the Lord, Yahweh, and said, We beseech thee, O Lord. Right? And, and, and the all capitals there, this, this, this is specifying that they're not calling out to their gods. This is not the pagan gods. This is, this is Yahweh. This is what capital L-O-R-D is in the Old Testament. This is they are calling out to Jonah's God. We beseech thee, or or, or we uh, fervently beg you, is beseech. We we fervently beg you, O Lord. We fervently beg you again, O Lord. Let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood. For thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Can you imagine what's going through these guys' minds right now? It's got to be very similar to what was going through the minds of the prophets of Baal whenever Elijah 
is is dumping water all over this altar after these guys have been trying to call down fire from heaven and Elijah's just making a mockery out of them and then you know dumping water on this altar and Elijah calls down fire because he calls unto the God of heaven the one and only God this has got to be the same thought that's going on. Like you're calling to this God time and time again, and these people cutting themselves in, in the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal, doing everything they can. And then all of a sudden, Elijah comes up, and he calls to a God that actually answers. You know, and Elijah mocks these guys in this, in this uh, story. You know, and and he, he even says, is, is your God on the toilet? He even, he, I, I mean... It, that's what the text says. He's mocking them. Is your God away? Did he step away? Is he using the restroom? You know? And these guys are stepping back. Why does this God respond when ours doesn't? Jonah fesses up, gets thrown overboard. How does he respond? Jonah responded in rebellion here because he wanted what he wanted not what God wanted. Rebellion is a demonstration of self-will. We rebel because we think what we want is better than what God has commanded. Jonah finds out that his choice for rebellion was not the smartest. So now, let's look at chapter 2. As we come from Jonah's rebellion into Jonah's repentance. At the end of chapter 1, we see, you know, what we typically understand of the entire book of Jonah in verse 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah after he's been thrown overboard. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Right? And then we move now into Jonah's repentance. Chapter 2 and verse 2 says this. And said I, cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord. And he heard me, and out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Do you see the despair in Jonah's life at this moment? Can you, can you imagine what he's got to be thinking at this point? Because, because mind you, Jonah's not, Jonah is not fleeing from Nineveh because he, cause, cause he doesn't believe God. Jonah is fleeing from Nineveh because he does believe God. And now God has executed judgment on Jonah, and, and he has now swallowed him with a fish, right? And, and let, let's just bury this hatchet. A miracle is something that does not necessarily have to make scientific sense, right? We can, we can try to, to, to make all these different excuses and all these things about, about how a whale's stomach is made and how a shark's stomach is made. Folks, can I tell you that God doesn't have to work on your realm of comprehension, and that a miracle is a miracle for a reason. By definition, it is something that does not make sense scientifically. God can do what he wants. Uh, he, he doesn't have to, to work in our comprehensive level. Jonah cries out, almost a poetic cry, as he is in the belly of the whale. He speaks of it as being in the depths of hell. He was in horrible despair. I mean, can you imagine, honestly, though, the stench and the darkness and the despair that you would feel? We go through this, and for time's sake, we'll skip down. Let's skip down into verse 7 here. When my soul fainted within me. What's that next portion say? I remembered the Lord. How often is it that we don't remember God? until we reach this spot that Jonah reaches, when your soul faints within you. How often is it that we ignore God on the daily, that we ignore His Word on the daily, but when we're, when we're really down and out, when we've really tried everything else that we have had to try, when we've really attempted our way time and time again and failed, that we remember God. Jonah's prayer, though made it to God. He says, it came in unto thee, into thy holy temple. Look at verse 8. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. 
Jonah speaking excellent truth here, realizing that he himself has actually been acting as a pagan, that he himself has, has, has been worshiping his own desires. And Jonah speaks out the ultimate truth of the book of Jonah. Salvation is of the Lord. Salvation comes through no other. There is no other way. Salvation is of the Lord. And Jonah gives this prayer of thanksgiving to God for hearing him and, and for his mercy while he's in the belly of this beast. He realizes he's got no control. He realizes it's God who offers salvation, not Jonah. And look at verse 10. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. As you get that image through your mind, it's, it's a hard one to erase as you can, you can think of this fish just puking Jonah out and he's covered in all this vial and everything. But imagine how Jonah felt as he's just delivered from this, this feeling of agony and despair. He's delivered by God's providence only after he repents towards God and seeks his mercy. And I'd like to suggest to you this morning that upon repentance comes deliverance. And, and deliverance from God is taken in many different shapes and forms. And it doesn't have to, God doesn't have to spit you out from the belly of a whale. But listen, if you repent towards God and you ask Him to save you from your sin and you get real with God and say, God, I know that you are who you say you are and I know that you are holy and righteous and just, and I know that I am a sinner who has transgressed against you, and that you sent your son to save me from my sin, he will immediately deliver you from the judgment that you are rightfully due. God is holy and righteous, and upon repentance comes deliverance. How did Jonah respond here in chapter 2? When Jonah realized that he was wrong, right? He was at the very bottom. He was at the very bottom here. When Jonah realized he was in a position that he could not get himself out of, he remembered the Lord. So many people get stuck and wallow in their distress and their self-pity rather than giving it to God. And so Jonah does rightfully here by when he realizes that he is down and out. He doesn't sit and pout. He doesn't say, you know, hey, I, I, you know, I messed up. How can I get myself out of this? he decides that he is going to give this to God. And he turns to him and cries to him and repents to him. And he claims salvation is of the Lord. Delivered by God. Now we look at Jonah chapter 3 after we've seen in first Jonah's rebellion and then Jonah's repentance. And now we see here Jonah's revival in chapter 3. God calls to Jonah again. Very familiar phrase. Arise, verse 2, chapter 3. Go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach it unto, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. The exact same thing that he told him as we open this book, and I praise God that he's patient and he's long suffering. How many times does God tell us? This is what I want you to do. And then we turn a stiff neck to him and we put our nose up at him. And he comes back again like we've never heard it before. Patiently says the same thing over again. This is what I want you to do. You know, he, he's not rubbing our nose in it. But God says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go to Nineveh. And I want you to preach to Nineveh what I'm telling you to preach to Nineveh. He gave Jonah another chance and praise the Lord that he gives us another chance as well. So Jonah rose and this time he did go to Nineveh. Now Nineveh happens to be a very huge city, a very old city dating back like uh, 4,000, 4,500 BC, right? This has had a lot of time to, to build and, and, and Nimrod would have been uh, one of the very first people involved. So if you remember the account of Nimrod, then you, you, you are like at the foundation of the time of the city of Nineveh. 
and, and it's a very, very old, very large city. So Jonah gets there, and it says that, verse 4, Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. I mean, he's, he's already walking in, you know, 10, 12, 15 miles into the city here. He's walking in some, some way. And then look at the message that Jonah preaches. This is what God told Jonah to preach. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Pretty simple message, right? Pretty short, pretty to the point. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. You say, how come he didn't go there and preach health, wealth, prosperity? You know, give, give, give me a, give me a coin, and God will do great things for you, and make promises. Because that's not the message God gave Jonah to preach to Nineveh. The God gave Jonah the message of repent, or else. If you don't repent, judgment's coming. Jonah says, 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Remember what happens when Jonah takes some responsibility in the first chapter? And then we see these pagan men start to come to God. And it, and it appears here, and we can't say for sure, that, but it appears here that these people could have been genuinely saved by this encounter. Look what happens when Jonah fully takes the will of God upon his shoulders and walks into this city, Nineveh. It says, verse 4, Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days in Nineveh shall be overthrown. Verse 5, So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. So socially, I mean the highest ranking people down to the peasants, they're all believing God and they're all repenting. Verse 6, for word came out unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast nor herd nor flock taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? Can I let you in on something this morning? Jonah saw this coming. And that's why Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. It sounds contradictory, but it's the truth. Let them turn everyone from his evil way. The king of Nineveh gets this decree that comes out from Jonah, and he decides that he doesn't want anything to do with God's judgment, right? This is, this is a pagan man, and, and he is the king of the, the largest, most predominant evil city in the world at this time, and he sends out this decree that even cover the cows and the pigs and everything, everybody is going to turn to God, and everybody is going to fast here. How did God respond to their repentance? Verse 10 in chapter 3. And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. In other words, very similar to the situation where God changed his mind in the account of Moses, where he had decided that he was going to bring judgment upon the children of Israel, right? Here's the same concept. God has said, yet 40 days, and I'm going to destroy Nineveh. Jonah goes in, he preaches for a day, and then all of a sudden, all of Nineveh repents, and God lifts his hand of judgment off of Nineveh and changes his mind on what he's going to do to them. How did Jonah respond? After repenting and getting in the will of God, Jonah responds by doing what God wants him to do. And what was the result? A massive revival. More than 120,000 people in Nineveh. Jonah goes and he, he, he preaches this message that says, straighten up or 40 days you're going to be overthrown. 
more than 120,000 people believed the word of God that came from the mouth of Jonah. And Nineveh was brought to life and saved from its judgment. We've seen Jonah's rebellion. We've seen Jonah's repentance. We've seen Jonah's revival. And now, let's look at Jonah's regret. Chapter 4 is probably the hardest chapter in the book of Jonah. Well, undoubtedly the hardest chapter in the book of Jonah to wrap your mind around. Look at, and you say why. Look at verse 1, chapter 4. Mind you, they just had like one of the biggest revivals to ever take place. All these people getting saved. Chapter 4, verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. You're like, what is wrong with Jonah, right? Because any any preacher would just absolutely love to see you know one person come to Christ. Any Christian would love to see just one person come to Christ. Here's 120,000 plus people come to Christ, and chapter four and verse one opens with, and it made Jonah angry. Verse two, and Jonah prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord. Was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Now look and see the reason Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. Here's the reason. Because I told you in chapter 1 that Jonah knew God. And that Jonah had an accurate understanding of who God was. And therefore he did not want to go to Nineveh because Jonah hated the people of Nineveh. And you say, why did Jonah hate the people of Nineveh? Because they hated the Hebrews. This would be like, this would be like a Jewish person going and preaching to Adolf Hitler. Right? The, the Ninevites made ISIS look like Girl Scouts. I, if you read through historical accounts of the people of Nineveh, they, they took people and they literally scalped them alive before they killed them. Right? The stuff that they did before killing their enemies was like on a whole nother scale of gruesome and terrible. And these people were horrible people. And Jonah hated them. And could you blame him? These are his people, his loved ones. And these people from Nineveh are scalping them alive before they kill them making mockeries out of them before they kill them. And Jonah decides these people don't deserve God's salvation. How easy is it for us today to get caught up in the political suicide, in the social unrest, and to find people who don't think like you, who don't look like you, who don't act like you, and to think, this guy doesn't deserve God's salvation. It's a really easy slope to fall down, right? This, this guy's not like me. And, you know, he's vulgar. And he's nasty. And the things he does are nasty. And, 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 and the lifestyle he lives is nasty, right? And, and you all know about the child sex trafficking that's going on right now. Let's contextualize this today. Do those people deserve God's grace and mercy? Wouldn't you just like to get five minutes with that guy? Right? Can we be honest this morning and say, I'd like to. God help the man who would try to take my child. Right? Because I will execute Daniel's wrath on you. And yet God is here. Same situation that Jonah is. Extending grace and mercy out unto these people that we look at and we think, I'd like to get five minutes alone with you so that I can show you what God should be doing to you. Chapter 4, verse 2. Look at the reason Jonah decided he wasn't going to Nineveh. And he reminds God, he said, O oh Lord, was not yet this my saying when I was in my country? The reason I fled unto Tarshish is because this. Number one, I knew that you are a gracious God. 
and merciful, secondly. You're slow to anger, thirdly. Fourthly, and of great kindness. And fifthly, and repentest thee of the evil. Or, or that you're capable of changing your mind. Right? The book of Daniel says that nobody can sway God's hand. If God decides to change his mind, guess what? He's God. He can do it. If God decides to not change his mind, guess what? He's God. He can do it. Jonah says, I knew you. And I knew you so well. This is the very reason that I'm not going to Nineveh because I hate those people and I knew you'd save them. Because you reach down into the depths of human depravity and even these people, even these molesters, even these rapists, even these people who scalp a person alive and watch them suffer, you would save even them. And how hard is that for us to gather? These are the folks that, that you, you take the 9-11 incident, right? Wouldn't you like to just have some time with bin Laden to talk with him about that? All the folks that that has killed, Americans, right? And we've been fighting this war for years and years and years beyond this. These are the people that God sent his son to die for. And we hate them. And we shouldn't. And it's tough. And we're just like Jonah. Because we know that God is gracious. God is merciful. God is long-suffering. He is patient. And God can change his mind according to his will. And it's hard for us to gather that. That's why Jonah decided that he wasn't going to Nineveh. Jonah knew God. And look further here. He says, therefore, verse 3, the chapter gets even harder to understand. Therefore now, O Lord, take I, I, I beg you, my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. This is how much Jonah hated the people from Nineveh. Jonah did what God wanted him to do, but he's so upset with doing what God wanted him to do that he now wants to die. Then said the Lord, does it do you well to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. Paint this picture in your mind's eye. Jonah... Jonah leaves and goes and sets up on this like auditorium and builds himself like a little shaded uh, hut and he sits down and he watches Nineveh waiting for God to execute fire and brimstone and judgment upon Nineveh and to totally wipe these people out. And he waits and he waits and he waits and God saves Nineveh. But Jonah is just so full of hate for these people that he's not having it. God says, do you have a right to be angry? Look at the extreme hatred that Jonah has here. Verse 5. Jonah went out of the city. He made him this booth. He sits under the booth in verse 6. And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceedingly glad of the gourd. So God makes this like big vine that comes over Jonah and it shades him from the, the, the desert wind and the desert sun. And Jonah is really glad now that he has got this shaded auditorium to watch the peril of Nineveh. Verse 7. But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day. And it smote the gourd that it withered. And it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die and said, it's better for me to die than to live. In verse 9, God said to Jonah, does it do you well to be angry for the gourd? Jonah's response. And he said, I do well to be angry even to death. Can you see the hatred that Jonah has here? I mean, 
this this is this is stubbornness on a level that we often don't see. Jonah's now had this little bit of shade taken away from him. Very upset about it. Wishes again to die. Verse 10, then said the Lord, You've had pity on the gourd for which you did not labor, neither did you make it grow, which came up in one night and perished in one night? He's asking Jonah this kind of rhetorical question here. You're, you're, you're worried about this gourd, yet you're not worried about these 120,000 plus people in Nineveh? And he says, you didn't even make the gourd. You didn't even labor for the gourd. But yet, God fearfully and wonderfully makes each and every one of us. There is an intimate part that God has with the creation of each and every person. That God is forming you in the womb of your mother. That you are made in the image of God. No matter what ethnicity, by the, word, by the way, I, I don't like this, you know, we call it race. It's not race, there's one race. And Brooke gets upset with me because on a doctor's forum it'll ask you what your race is and I put human. Um, because I'm not going to aid to this, right? It's, it's an ethnicity. No matter what ethnicity you are, no matter, you know, no matter what nation you're from, you're made in the image of God. The man who is the whitest of white or the man who's the blackest of black or the man who's brown, if you stop and think we are all made in God's image, the man who's short, the man who's tall, we are all made in the image of God. And God is relaying this to Jonah that he made these people from Nineveh. And Jonah's got pity on this plant. And here's the ultimate problem. We choose here who we think deserves salvation. We choose who we think would be fit for the kingdom of God. We choose who we think is deserving. But if we're honest with ourselves this morning, none of us are. None of us have lived up you know, you see somebody sometimes, perhaps a drunkard, someone that's heavy on drugs, and you see, you see them and you think, what a waste, and, and, and how pitiful is that life. But in the eyes of God, that individual is made in His image and has just as much right and authority to the throne of God if they would just come to Him and repent, then they would be delivered. And the problem is, when we witness, we like to pick and choose. Like, yeah, it'd be easy to go to this person's house to witness, or this person looks nice, you know, they'll probably accept Christ as their Savior if I give them the gospel, right? What about the guy coming off a three-day drunk that, that, that he has just been out of prison and he's, you know, lapsing over? What about him? Does, does he not deserve the grace and love of Christ? And, and it's hard because we do judge people. And it's, and it's easy to, to judge those. And, and, it's, and it's a fine line to walk. But we have to be careful. When God told us to witness to the world, He didn't specify. He said, go and tell all nations and preach and teach and baptize in My name. Jonah was given the command, the imperative, by God in the Old Testament. He said, go to Nineveh, tell them. Jesus gave us the commandment in the New Testament. He said, go, teach, preach, baptize all nations in my name. Right? And, and there is no second choice. You say, well, what if I don't fulfill the Great Commission? What if I don't tell other people about the gospel of Jesus Christ? You say, is there another way that the gospel message gets out? The answer is no. There is no other way. God, God, we are God's spokespeople. We are His, His vessel. 
God did not sit down with, with Gabriel and make a backup plan for in case his people did not follow the Great Commission. The angels are not going to come down and start preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. There is no second plan. It is us. We are his vocal box. We are his people. You talk to so many people that this is the one thing that they can't get past. This is their stumbling block. This is what they say. If God's such a good God, would He not allow me into heaven being such a good person? You know, I've given a lot of money to the church. I've given a lot of help to a lot of people, right? And that doesn't matter. God says that's like a dirty cloth in His face. The only thing that measures up is the shed blood of Jesus Christ. When God looks at you on the day that you stand before His throne, the thing that He needs to see to make you measure up is the shed blood of Jesus Christ. God is a God of love. He's a God of mercy. He's slow to anger. He's of great kindness. Jonah realizes that a life in the will of God is easier than a life in rebellion. And I want you to realize this morning as we close out here that a rebellious people dwell in a dry land. And we have to be very cautious of being sleeping Christians, content in our own will. Chapter 1, Jonah's rebellion. Chapter 2, Jonah's repentance. Chapter 3, Nineveh's revival. And chapter 4, Jonah's regret. It's a very weird way to end a book. But how does the book of Jonah end? Jonah's back asleep. And you can almost hear the alarm call of God going off again to Jonah. And we have to be so conscious to be awake to God's will for us. And it's not our decision to choose who would come to Christ. It's God's decision. The Bible says we all are deserving of eternal death, but God wants all to come to repentance and salvation in Him. In the eyes of perfection, the only thing that's good enough is standing in unison with Jesus Christ. Let's pray this morning.